sounds like there's a lot of work to be done that what you're, it would be accurate to say that the funding that's, the new funding and what's happening now is helping those people probably most severely in need, but there are people who are in need. Our approach as the health system is we focus on reducing mortality and morbidity, but we can make gains in those, and we actually have made significant gains in those, but that doesn't mean that we've met everybody's need across the board. Will you be making alterations to uh, the requirements in the contract for health based on these types of insights so that when the next RFP goes out and if it's Corizon or whoever, that you'll be trying to capture addressing these issues, or do you not have, do you, do you believe you have enough money that you that could be allocated? Um, you know, I'm sort of going all over the place, but do you think that when you issue your next RFP, that in the deliverables for what you'll be asking for the provider to do for inmates, that you'll be asking for them to do additional or different or more nuanced things based on what we see happening with mental health services today? Absolutely. The current contract with Corizon for the first time reflects preventable hospitalizations. That's an approach to promoting quality that we took from hospital settings. It's not really present in any other correctional settings. Also, the current contract has explicitly written in participation in human rights activities, which there's no other jail really even using the word human rights because we think it's really fundamental to getting people connected to their care. And so whoever is providing the care is going to be participating in these types of activities. Thank you. Uh, Chair Crowley. Thank you, Chair Johnson. And summary, because we're, we're getting Horizon up in a few minutes. You said you choose the best, be it a profit or a nonprofit company that will provide the needs, basic health care needs of those in our jails. But Horizon has fallen short in four, far too many cases. We've had deaths brought on because somebody didn't get their basic seizure medication, a death because somebody didn't get their basic blood pressure medication. And one of the most egregious deaths that I read about was a young 19-year-old who had chest pains for seven long months and had seen a healthcare professional eight times. That young boy died in his cell because he had a tear in his aorta. And never once did he ever get a chest x-ray. And that's crazy. We need a more efficient health care provider on our, in our jails. And that is your job. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Crowley. I, I, I want to say, uh, uh, you know, Dr. Angel and Dr. Venters, uh, and uh, I really mean this, and I know you're not doing this type of work to get praise and adulation, but I am very grateful for your expertise, uh, especially you, Dr. Venters, who is on Rikers Island every day. I know that uh, inmates care uh, and treating them with compassion is uh, really you know, your guiding post as a doctor. And you have shown that consistently, uh, not just through your answers here today, but when I was on Rikers Island with you, the level of insight and expertise that uh, this city has through your service, I think is really commendable. There are systematic issues and problems. It's a complicated place. The answers aren't always easy, but I think that you have done a tremendous job, and it's important to recognize that uh, when we see it. Um, so I just wanted to thank you for uh, the level of questioning that you went through today uh, to, to give us some more insight. Uh, but I also want to say that, you know, there are still big problems, as we know. And uh, I know that you recognize that as well. And I also know that the thing that may not be easy to say is the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene is not in the easiest position. You don't control Rikers Island. The Department of Corrections does. So the relationship between the two departments is sensitive and tricky. Uh, because you're providing care while corrections is in charge of the administration and of your own and of your safety and your staff safety. So it's complicated and that dynamic needs to be recognized. I, I just want to say that before Horizon uh, comes up that uh, Councilmember Crowley was uh, referring to Andy Enriquez uh, who, who died 19 years old. 
didn't get a chest x-ray. Torn aorta, basic, simple thing. We look further, and we see that... Uh, I just think it's important to, to say this because it's easy when you talk about numbers, but when you actually talk about individuals, 36-year-old man with a severe seizure disorder died two days after he was placed in solitary confinement and denied his medication. 59-year-old drug addict who was not properly assessed for constipation, a common side effect of methadone, died, bacterial infection in his stomach and intestines because of bloody stools. Inmates suffering from asthma who were not properly treated. An inmate who died of sepsis after being turned away from a clinic because a high number of emergency patients who were in line before him. An inmate that within two days of arriving at Rikers died of a diabetic coma. An inmate that was placed in a holding cell with his hands cuffed behind his back and died of a sudden heart problem. And an inmate that was confined to a cell for seven days and denied access to food, water, and medical care for his schizophrenia or insulin for his diabetes. These are people's lives. And I know, Dr. Venters, that you take this seriously. But my question is, does Corizon take this seriously? And are they doing all they can do to prevent these tragedies from happening? Thank you very much for your testimony today. I really appreciate it. So uh, up next, we're going to have uh, Dr. Jay Cohen. Cowan. From Corizon Health. And is that it? And Calvin Johnson? There's a... <laughs> And Calvin Johnson uh, from Corizon Health as well. We asked Ray to take care of it. So, if folks could go outside, that would be really helpful so that we can keep going because we really are under uh, the gun as it relates to time. We're supposed to be out of here by 1. That's not going to happen. We probably have until 1.30, and we want to get everyone to testify. Do, do you all have testimony for us? Yes. yes. Uh, you may begin uh, in whatever order you'd like. If you could please identify uh, yourselves uh, for the records. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Johnson and Chairwoman Crowley. Uh, I am Dr. Calvin Johnson, the Chief Medical Officer of uh, Corizon Health. I want to thank you for this opportunity to speak with you today. Um, it's clearly timely and important hearing at which we can discuss our shared objective for improving the quality of health care uh, on Rikers Island. By way of background, uh, I am, as I said, Chief Medical Officer for Corizon Health, uh, a graduate of Morehouse College, and uh, I've earned my medical degree both at, and Master's in Public Health at Johns Hopkins. Um, working to protect the public's health and safety has been a continuous thread throughout my career. I've had the opportunity Several, to serve several years as the Secretary of Health for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, where, among other things, I was successful in significantly increasing the funding for HIV AIDS prevention and early detection and establishing data-driven management systems to improve performance management and outcome measurements. Uh, earlier in my career, I had the privilege to, to be the Medical Director of Family Health Services actually here in the New York City Department of Health. With me today are Jessica Lee and uh, Susan Schranz. Ms. Lee, to my left here, is a registered nurse who is the Vice President of Operations for Corizon Health here in New York City. And she oversees the implementation of our contract with the city. Ms. Schranz, who is sitting uh, in the third row of the audience here, is Corizon Health's Chief Operating Officer for the Northeast Region. I'm also joined at the table by my colleague, Dr. Jay Cowan, the President of Correctional Medical Associates of New York, whom you'll hear from in just a few minutes. 
Corizon Health is the founder of Modern Contract Correctional Health Services. Uh, our company, whose origins are more than 35 years old, was created by a merger of the prison company Prison Health Services and Correctional Medical Services. We serve approximately 345,000 inmates in 27 states. We operate the health care systems in jails such as Philadelphia and St. Louis in addition to New York City. Our chief executive is Dr. Woodrow Myers, a, a nationally recognized public health expert and a former commissioner of the New York City Department of Health. Corizon Health, first through its predecessor, PHS, provided comprehensive health care services to New York City's inmates since January 1 of 2001. Our contract with New York City is unique. First, New York City provides more services to inmates than any other jurisdiction in the United States. The care you require to be provided is more complete and comprehensive than anywhere else in the country, something certainly to be proud of. Second, the Department of Hi uh, Health and Mental Hygiene programs for Rikers actually have three components to them. Corizon Health, Correctional Medical Associates of New York, which is CMA, and Correctional Dental Associates of New York, CDA. In the most simplified description, CMA is the entity that provides all the medical and mental health services, while CDA provides all the dental and oral surgery services. Corizon Health provides the administrative and business management services, such as overseeing the entire contract and making sure that there is full compliance with its terms, such as issues of staffing, purchasing, information technology support, we provide all human resources services, including credentialing, screening potential employees, orienting new hires to uh, safety procedures and policies, and tracking the statistical data of all the patients. We are the administrative liaison to the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene and the three unions. We also coordinate the care of the patients, for example, scheduling and coordinating their off-island appointments, such as when they need to see a doctor at Bellevue or at Elmhurst Hospitals. Horizon Health, CMA, and CDA each contribute their expertise. To the outside world, this consortium appears seamless, as it should. And like the public hospitals, many of the approximately 78,000 admissions that we receive each year present with at least one chronic illness and often associated complications. And many of our patients have not received regular or consistent care over time. We work very closely with the Department of Health and Mental Health and want to thank Dr. Angel and Dr. Venters, who you heard from, for their assistance, guidance, and collaboration, and Commissioner Bassett for her leadership and personal interest in improving correctional health. Working in partnership with the department, our program is constantly evolving to meet the needs of this underserved segment of our community and to bolster DOHMH's public health initiatives. We also especially appreciate Commissioner Pont's interest and direct involvement in addressing safety issues on the island. Both commissioners have opened up new channels of discussion and cooperation, unheard of previously in the history of this contract, to better serve the patients on Rikers Island and to address issues of concern amongst us. We have seen a significant change in the last year or so and are greatly appreciative of it and look forward to expanding that collaboration even further. We also applaud Mayor de Blasio for his reforms and innovations, especially in the area of mental health and look forward to implementing those initiatives. We cannot agree more that the mental health services at Rikers need to be viewed as part of a full continuum, from police encounter to discharge after incarceration for those who cannot be diverted along the way. Uh, before I turn to Dr. Cowan, let me make one more point, and, and that is that every person who works for CMA or Corizon Health is personally affected when a patient suffers an adverse outcome. Our goal is to give the best care that we know how to give. We don't cut corners. We have no incentive to do anything but give the best care that we can possibly give. A and let me explain. We have, as you heard Dr. Angel describe, the cost plus contract. In that kind of contract, staffing levels, range of services, quality measurements are all established by DOHMH. Failing to provide these services is wrong and contrary to the values of our company and our providers. To say otherwise is not understanding the contract and really not understanding the dedicated men and women who do serve on the front lines uh, 
providing the care to a very difficult population in very difficult circumstances. Dr. Cowan will now talk about medical services and operations on Rikers, and, and then we'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Is that working? Thank you, Dr. Johnson. And thank you to Chair Johnson, Chair Crowley, and members of both committees for this opportunity to address <laughs> you this afternoon regarding the quality and access of health care at Rikers Island. My name is Jay Cowan. I'm a physician and I'm president of Correctional Medical Associates of New York commonly known as CMA. As Dr. Johnson mentioned, my colleagues and I provide the actual medical care to Rikers Island inmates. I am board certified in internal medicine and gastroenterology and licensed to practice medicine in the state of New York. I've been practicing internal medicine for more than 25 years. I'm a graduate of Brown University, Howard University Medical School, and my current, prior to my current position, I practiced medicine in Harlem for 15 years both at Harlem Hospital and North General Hospital. I'm joined by my partners, Dr. Neil Leibowitz, a board certified psychiatrist and director of our mental health unit services, and Dr. Louis Cintron, my deputy medical director, who's also board certified in internal medicine. As Dr. Johnson explained, CMA operates all of the medical and mental health services on Rikers Island. It is our responsibility to make sure that the medical care is provided at the highest level. Our responsibility I take very seriously. Our services begin as soon as inmates enter DOC custody. We are charged with providing a thorough and complete examination of every patient prior to them being housed. This is a service that is provided 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Each patient receives an examination that takes on average of an hour to complete. This is an underserved patient population that suffers from health care disparities. Some of the patients, of course, have been through the system before, but no matter how recently they've been through the system, they still receive a thorough examination. We give each patient a careful and thorough examination. The clinician determines what lab tests and other screenings need to be done for each patient. The mental health screening is also conducted, and inmates with mental illness are referred for further evaluation and treatment. In addition, patients are tested for tuberculosis, provided counseling with regard to their respective conditions, given the appropriate medication, and offered the opportunity to take an HIV test and counseling with regards to sexually transmitted diseases. About 35% of new admissions to Rikers Island have a chronic medical problem. Since the institution of electronic medical records, we are now better able to track these patients throughout their stay. Our doctors, physician assistants, nurse practitioners, nurses, pharmacists, and psychologists, and other comprehensive, and others provide comprehensive services in 11 facilities across the island. We provide primary care, specialty care, and emergency services. There's an on-site dialysis unit, a communicable disease unit, OBGYN services, a nursery, methadone maintenance, as well as drug and alcohol detoxification programs. We do this in an extremely complex environment for a patient population that is not there of their own choice. We staff clinics 24 hours a day. Patients can access these services through sick call, chronic care follow-up, medical emergencies, and specialty services. An on-site emergency care is available 24 hours a day at our Urgy Center. The center is staffed by a board-certified emergency room physician that, that are equipped to handle a wide range of medical emergencies. Patients who have needs that cannot be met on the island and those with life-threatening conditions are transferred to an HHC hospital by FDNY Emergency Medical Services. As you all know, the percentage of inmates with mental illness issues has greatly increased. This has put additional strain on our ability to provide care for all of our patients. We are deeply appreciative 
and thankful for the additional funding that the mayor and the city council provided, which has allowed us to almost double the number of mental health professionals that we employ on Rikers Island. Violence continues to be a major problem on the island, but as an employer who cares about the well-being of patients, the correctional staff, and every one of our employees, I want to acknowledge the reforms that have been begun by Mayor de Blasio and, the commis and Commissioners Bassett and Pont. For example, panic buttons are now being installed in mental health cubicles where correctional <laughs> officers cannot be within hearing distance for privacy reasons. Also, the DOC is working with us on enhanced safety training for all of our staff. Excuse me. No one should have to come to work and worry about their personal safety. We continue to work with our counterparts to secure a safe environment for all of our staff. Finding people who want to enter such an environment is difficult. It takes a special person to want to work in a jail setting. Our 900 employees come to work every day to provide the highest quality care to the 11,000 individuals on Rikers Island. They come to work with the understanding that they deliver this care in an often hostile environment. Our employees see it as a calling to help others who don't have any other health care available to them. We work very closely with the officials of the Department of Health and Corizon to find new and innovative ways to deliver care. Over the last year, our partnership with DOHMH has enabled us to institute some cutting edge programs that are already leading to better results for our patients. For example, there are now specialized housing units for the mentally ill, which provide more nurses, more op observation opportunities, and more programming. Medication compliance has increased. Our medical staff keeps up to date on new advances and trends in medicine. To further this, we, insti we instituted island-wide monthly conferences and weekly lectures specifically concerning correctional medicine so all of our practitioners can continue learning and give back to their patients. Our employees are ethnically diverse, and most of them are from New York City. Virtually all of our employees are members of 1199 SEIU, New York State Nurses Association, and Doctors' Council SEIU. They deserve the respect they earn through their hard work. <coughs> Providing comprehensive health care in this complex environment is a daunting task, but one that we are honored to perform every day on behalf of the citizens of this great city. We are committed to working with the de Blasio administration, the Department of Health, the Department of Corrections, and the City Council in any way we can to continuously improve the quality of care at Rikers Island. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Johnson, and thank you, Dr. Cowan, for being here today and for your testimony. Uh, I, I really do have no doubt that the healthcare workers employed by CMA are dedicated and that they take their mission seriously and furthermore that they are deeply affected when a patient dies in their care. I want to read this again because you didn't talk about any of this. In the past five years there have been over 15 deaths at Rikers Island in which the quality or timeliness of health care was an issue. The deaths reported include a 36-year-old man with a severe seizure disorder who died two days after he was placed in solitary confinement and was denied medication. A 59-year-old drug addict was not properly assessed for constipation, a common side effect of methadone, and died of a bacterial infection in his stomach and intestines after days of bloody stools. Inmates suffering from asthma who were not properly treated, an inmate who died of sepsis after being turned away from the clinic because of a high number of emergency patients before him, an inmate that within two days of arriving at Rikers died in a diabetic coma, an inmate that was placed in a holding cell with his hands cuffed behind his back and died of a sudden heart problem, uh, an inmate that was confined to a cell for seven days, denied access to food, water, medical care for his 
schizophrenia or insulin for his diabetes. And as Chair Crowley has mentioned a few times, Andy Enriquez, a 19-year-old who was never given a chest, chest X-ray and uh, died from a, a tear in his aorta. None of that was mentioned in your testimony. So what we have to distinguish between is not the able and committed job that these workers are doing, and I believe that they're likely doing on Rikers Island in these challenging circumstances. I think that you outlined quite well the difficulty that we see at Rikers. The question is whether your leadership, the leadership at Corizon, at CMA, brings the drive and commitment to innovate that this system needs. What kinds of process and system reforms are you recommending and implementing? When there is an arguably preventable death, do you undertake the kind of root cause analysis that hospitals and other first-rate institutions undertake? I'm happy to hear that you're happy to get all these additional monies for uh, the seriously mental ill. Were you requesting that? Were you identifying for years, here are the endemic problems at Rikers Island that we're facing so that these preventable deaths don't happen? These patients and inmates are in your custody and care. They're in the corrections department custody, but they're in your care. What is the leadership doing at Corizon to stop this from happening? That is what I want to know, because you didn't mention any of that in your testimony. So we can go through case by case, but what are you doing to stop this? Because I don't want to come back three years from now after a contract's renewed and we have more of these awful cases that we're hearing about because people are being denied the treatment that they deserve. All right, th thank you, Chairman Johnson, and, and you... Um, you pose very fair and legitimate questions, and, and I think we, we certainly understand and respect your indignation and, and, um, and fr seeming frustration around this. So let me answer first by telling you that, um, yes, absolutely, the leadership of Corizon is very committed to providing very high-quality health care, to identifying the causes and the problems when horrible events like the ones you described happen to people, to patients, people who have families, people who came with an expectation of getting good care and getting better in typical instances. So we are very committed to that. And we have, we do have um, very real systems in place uh, to address what often are um, system, systems issues and breakdowns because to your point, the, the individuals who are the care providers um, are credentialed, licensed professionals who are doing the absolute best job that they can given circumstances that they're in, given very complex medical conditions, very get complex uh, and difficult environments to work in. So um, every time it, there is a, a death or an injury or some other significant healthcare-related event, Horizon, it triggers what is called a sentinel event. And that sentinel event is this is a company-wide, a company-wide trigger. And the sentinel, when a sentinel event happens, what that triggers is a very comprehensive and thorough review that takes place at multiple levels. It takes place at the site level where that incident occurred. It takes place at a regional level, a step away that, that can then take into account issues, concerns, um, irregularities that would not necessarily be identified, recognized, or seen as clearly at the site level. Can you walk me through an incident where a sentinel event occurred and let me understand specifically what you all did in response to that sentinel event? So um, I, I don't know if I'm allowed to speak to any specific speak generally specific case, but I will speak to um, someone generally. So. There was, uh, there was a bit of talk about uh, uh, and concern around suicides and suicide prevention. And so a suicide will trigger 
an immediate sentinel event. And so what that happens, what then happens is that uh, at the site level, the chart is then gathered by the senior medical official at the site level. And then the regional medical official comes in and does a thorough chart review to ensure that the appropriate care was delivered, appropriate screenings were done, appropriate diagnosis was made, and appropriate treatment was written for and carried out for that individual. That incident is also then res uh, driven up to the Sentinel Event Committee, which is a committee of um, multiple professionals that includes healthcare professionals as well as uh, legal professionals and operational professionals, those who make sure that the, obviously the trains run on time and the clinic processes are in place. A review is done um, primarily by the clinical element there that then again looks at a higher level as to what was done, what was not done in, the care, in that instance of care, what is required of the site then where the incident occurred is something called a corrective action plan. That corrective action plan has prescribed elements of it that speak to um, the, the, uh, the specifics of the incident and um, what specifically triggered it, what specific steps will be taken then who is to correct it and prevent it from happening again, who is responsible for carrying out those elements. That corrective action plan is then monitored and tracked and uh, elements of it ensured are carried out by the Sentinel event committee and the quality, our quality and patient safety. We have a vice president of quality and safety who uh, is responsible for ensuring that then those corrective action plans get carried out. So Dr. So Johnson, case, you, you just took me through what, and I appreciate that you took me through what is basically root cause analysis. I mean, that's what's done at hospitals and at institutions. Okay. And, you know, the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner, these things are done regularly to have a check and to understand what happened in that individual case. I assume that in the 15 cases that I outlined that I would hope that that was done in those 15 cases. But what I want to really understand is what came out of that? Have, you, have there been any specific reforms? Have there been any recommendations that after performing uh, these root cause analyses after these sentinel events, what have you all learned and tried to implement so that this doesn't happen again? Absolutely. All the cases that you've identified, and I cannot discuss them, you know, individually, but generally speaking, all the cases that you have identified at Rikers Island have gone under a stringent review as a chart review, mortality review, internally with CMA staff and Corizon and island-wide with oversight from DOHMH. We review every chart from day of admission to day of discharge, day of death. And corrective actions have been identified for each particular case if and when we believe uh, an omission or commission has taken place. But I was asking for something system-wide, not individual cases, but are there recommended reforms that look at the broader picture, yes. island-wide or facility-wide, that you've learned from looking at these sentinel events? I apologize. So the corrective action plans that are addressed look to system issues uh, that transcend an individual case and may involve one or many facilities. For example, transportation of people on suicide watch. It's a concern for us. We now, as a medical company, track movement of our patients in custody from one facility to another facility, ensuring that they get to where we want them to be in a timely manner and get the services that that facility can provide for them. Okay, I I'm gonna move to my colleagues in a moment for questions. I, I just want to drive home the point and correct me if I'm wrong. I, I mean, I am very 
sympathetic with the de Blasio administration and the new leadership at the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene and the new leadership at the Department of Corrections because they inherited a goddamn mess from the Bloomberg administration. Rikers Island was like the Wild West. And as much as people want to talk about what a great manager Mayor Bloomberg was, what the hell was happening on Rikers Island all these years under different corrections commissioners? What these new monies that have been identified and that this administration has put in the budget for seriously mentally, mentally ill people, for the CAPS unit, for the PACE unit, for uh, diversion issues, all of these things. Were you guys recommending that years ago? You've been there a long time. What recommendations have you all made over years of dysfunction to make the place better? You're thanking us for the money now, but what proactive steps have you all taken to say, here are the issues, help make it better for our workers and for the inmates? So first of all, in regards to the safety concerns for our workers, that's a priority for us. Our workers should not be subjected to coming to work every day in an unsafe environment. You're not answering the questions. What is the answer to what recommendations you have made over the years to try to make Rikers Island a better place? What have you asked the city for? Besides getting the $140 million a year to provide the services, what have you all done to say, this is what we do to make it better? The testimony was great. I'm wondering you know, what actual proactive things you're doing. So there are some significant problematic issues at Rikers Island. I think we all agree. I am passionate about the care that we deliver at Rikers Island. But there are some obstacles to us being able to deliver those, that care in a timely manner. And I think we're all aware of what some of those obstacles are. We work with our client, the New York City Department of Health, on a weekly, sometimes, actually daily basis at Rikers Island, discussing issues that are pertinent to the way in which we can deliver quality care in our clinics <laughs> across the island. Were the, you asking for these monies a long time ago for we, more mental health providers? We, we work with our client. You're not answering the question. Mr. Chairman, I think we, the we, discussion is being evasive. I don't mean to be evasive, it, it, sir. Let me, let, me, let me respond this way, Penn. So, um, you, you, you indicated and your colleagues indicated uh, in the course of this morning um, the, the complexity of the, the structure at, of, of care delivery for inmates at Rikers Island. And so that complexity, I think, works in many ways and there are reasons for it being in place. But I think it also speaks to the fact that um, it's not as simple and direct a one-to-one -one correlation as ask and receive. And so when issues like this occur, the partners involved, there are, as Dr. Cowens indicated, there is regular and consistent dialogue, engagement, and involvement. This is a partnership in, in delivering care on Rikers Island. There's, okay, there's, you're there's still no not that. answering the questions. I'm going to turn it over to my um, the, the chair. But Mr. Chair, I certainly am, I am trying well, to. Well, I'm saying, ha what recommendations have you made over the years to try to make the place a better place? The de Blasio administration stepped up, came up with tens of millions of dollars to try to change course at Rikers Island after years of violence and endemic systematic problems. You've been there for a long time. You were there in the Bloomberg years and you're there in the de Blasio years. I'm not hearing anything specific about what you all have recommended over the years to make the place a better place, to get more money to provide care in the way that you think would benefit your workers and to benefit the, the inmates on Rikers Island. So, you know, I, I'm not going to keep asking. I'm going to turn it over to Chair Crowley. Uh, before, thank you. Chair Johnson, before I begin my line of questions, uh, Council Member Cohen has a quick question. He has to go. He has one o'clock appointment. I'm going to allow him to ask questions. He's next after me, and then I'm going to come back to me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chairs Crowley and Chair Johnson. Uh, thank you, doctors, for your testimony. I just have two, uh, two uh, lines of questioning. You, you talked about, uh, in your testimony, panic buttons for when uh, it might not be appropriate because of privacy concerns. Uh, to have a corrections officer in, uh, present during treatment, how do you strike that balance? I mean, th that seems like a very difficult. Uh, uh, what What are the parameters on which those decisions are made? 
And thank you for that question. You're absolutely right. It's a difficult uh, decision to have to make. In our mental health areas, it's extremely important that the doctor-patient relationship be a good relationship, especially when it comes to mental health. There's privacy issues. So correctional officers should not be privileged to that conversation that occurs between a clinician and their patient. However, jail is a violent place. We do have what's known as an aggressive patient alert list. It was referenced uh, to before in, in the Department of Health's conversation. There are some 265 people on the aggressive patient alert list. Providers, before they see a patient, review this list and see if the patient pops up. If they do, they, if the patient is on the list and they're about to see this patient, they reach out to a correctional officer in the clinic and possibly even a captain to assist with that encounter. <laughs> they do have cuff bars in certain cubicles now for extremely aggressive patients. But it's a, it's a balance that we deal with every day, sir, and it is difficult. Just going back to the, uh, the financing question, uh, I don't want to get myself in trouble, but uh, the Department of Health said that you had no disincentive to uh, not provide services. But I guess is really the model sort of where the Department of Health is like the insurance company, you're the provider, and the, and the uh, inmates are the patient. Uh, does the department, if you wanted to provide services, do you have to go to the Department of Health and say, this, this inmate needs something uh, unusual or do you have to, to clear services with the Department of Health before you provide the services? The analogy you, you just utilized, I, I don't agree that I look at the Department of Health as an insurance company. We work hand in hand with the Department of Health every day. We have what's known as a matrix and it's approved by the Department of Health. It's a staffing matrix that tells us how many physicians, how many physician assistants how many mental health clinicians, how many nurses are in a specific clinic at a designated hour on an eight-hour tour. And the funding is provided for that. This is something that is agreed upon by CMA, Corizon, and the Department of Health. So if I could just, if I could just add to that, uh, Councilman, that so, so it is a, it is a kind of planned, a, a planned process um, where Expenses are essentially determined what expected expenses would be, and so there's there is formulas, there's calculations that go into what the expense would likely be, and so that's what the the budget is is built around. In instances where there is there may be a particularly unusual high expense, there is as as Dr. Cowan indicates, there's consistent and continuous dialogue between um, Corizon and CMA and the and the Department of Health, so that it's it's not a blank check in any way. And that the care, that the care um, decisions or costs of care, if exorbitant, are actually discussed. So that if there's something that deviates from what is planned, other than staffing issues or otherwise, that way. So th I hope that answers your question, some, sir. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Barron. I want to thank the chairs for allowing me to get my quick question in and brief comment because I do have another committee hearing. Um, Dr. Cowan? Excuse me, yes. And Dr. Johnson. Johnson. Dr. Johnson, in your day-to-day -day operation, to whom do you report? I report to the chief executive officer of the company. And you would do that on a daily basis? Yes. Okay. And they didn't think that it was important enough for them to come and be here? No, I wouldn't say that. No. Okay. I'm surprised that given the nature and the severity of this question, of this hearing, that someone else wouldn't be here in addition to you. And my comment is I was very, very disheartened and annoyed and angered that in none of your testimony did you cite the deaths of those persons who were at Rikers. Not to give any personal details or individual information, but to make mention of the fact that it happened. To me, it sends a signal that those lives are perhaps not as important as other lives. And I'm very offended that you wouldn't at least mention that that's a big problem with this, uh, with your organization, not to have mentioned that they occurred. C Councilwoman, if I may, um, I, 
I, again, I, I understand your, um, I, I understand what you're articulating. Um, please don't take from us the lack of a specific mention in prepared remarks any consideration or you, I, or, I said it's or, not in the prepared remarks so perhaps they will make an insertion to acknowledge that this is a problem you talked about the employee problems and all of that but to not have mentioned it is well, really I think offensive we, I, I think with all due respect that that we that we have indicated that um, that that when these events these events occur as have happened on Rikers Island it is a very serious event. It is taken very seriously. We recognize these individuals who have lost their lives or who have been injured not as numbers, not as indiscriminate or no-name patients, but as people. They are our patients. We know that they are connected to and attached to real people. And so please, please, if, if we gave that impression, That's the impression I apologize, I got. I apologize directly chair to you. who had to bring it to your attention that this is significant and was not in your testimony. Well, that was not our intent in any way. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you. Chair Crowley. Thank you, Chair. I uh, have a question as it relates to other municipal contracts Horizon has. Is the contract with New York City your largest contract? Uh, no, the New York City contract is not our largest contract. Well, it may be our largest municipal contract, jail contract, yes. Yeah, so yes. it's your largest sorry, municipal yes. contract. Mm -hmm. And despite your performance, you still get your profit. Well, in the contract, as, as Dr. Angel indicated, there is a, a flat fee that is uh, so a part of this Regardless contract. of your performance, you still get the same profit. So, so there are there are ways that the that the city takes back money or financial penalties if certain measures are not adhered to or met. Did you receive any financial penalties when you were downgraded in your rating last year? Doctor Dr. Kelly, you want to speak to that? Could you please repeat the question? My question earlier was, despite your performance, you still receive a profit from your work that you do on Rikers Island. When you were downgraded last year in your performance rating, did you receive any penalties, or did you still receive the profit you were expecting? The penalties that are assessed at Rikers Island are based upon the performance indicators. Right. The 40 performance indicators. Did when you receive a down, did you receive a penalty last year? There's a basic question, yes or no. If yes, then I would like to know how much. There, there, were, there were penalties assessed last year, yes, Our Councilwoman. Um, when you look over time at, with those performance indicators and the amount of penalties that have been assessed, they have declined over time. So that last year was less than in previous how years. How much was your penalty that you were assessed with last year? Do you have that? I don't have the exact figure. I can get that for you, though. Our penalties are assessed on a quarterly basis. Our PIs are monitored. The 40 PIs that were referenced to earlier are monitored by oversight from the Department of Health on a quarterly basis. Did you receive any penalty for your downgrading? Anything specific to that? No, there was no financial, uh, da financial uh, loss for the downgrade from good to fair on the evaluation for 2013 that we were aware of uh, in okay. 2014. And now, your contract in any given year is over $120 million. You receive at least a 4% profit based on what the Department of Health said. Uh, I, I, in, that, in their calculations, I think she may reference that it may average out to that. It is a flat fee. And then there is a small profit of 4.25% okay, well, what, what is what she last indicated. Year after you paid for your staff, um, I know you're not paying for malpractice insurance. So what was your profit? I don't, I don't know. That, I don't have the profit information. How do you here not know your profit I can give from you, last we year? Can give that to you. I, I didn't come prepared with profit. I came to but talk I about mean, the, the health care aspects of this. Representatives, you said, and I feel for your staff. I do. I can't imagine what it's like mm -hmm. for them to be stretched as thin as they are to try to provide quality service when there aren't enough clinicians or doctors mm -hmm. and make matters worse, they worry about their own physical safety. That's very safety. true. That's okay. very 
you said it's complex, there are obstacles, it's daunting. What are those obstacles that are daunting and complex? Well, and getting back to your question, Councilman, the new PACE units, the new CAPS units, we work with the Department of Health and design those units. The opening of the CAPS units that opened up a year and a half ago for patients with ser seriously mental illness, we work with our client and we worked on staffing and budgetary guidelines for those, for those units with Department of Health. The PACE units as well, Dr. Leibowitz and the mental health staff work with the mental health staff for the Department of Health looking at the staffing needs and the requirements of the mentally ill and come up with proposed requests for, for funds, if that's what you're referring to. No, I, I want to know what your excuse is for not providing care when you have inmates in need of care, when they uh, go undiagnosed or untreated. Councilman, I think, um, I, I think it is, it's unfair to characterize as um, us as wanting to or seeming to want to withhold care. There are issues, as Dr. Cowan has described, that certainly indicate that there are there are issues in delivery of care to uh, you know 11,000 inmates at any given time, um, 78,000 admissions a year. There is no question about that. Any health system, any health care provider has that, and we are no different in that, and we acknowledge that. Um, we've tried we've we've tried to share with you as well processes that we have and efforts that we've taken to, to correct those issues when they come to light, to try and identify them in advance, to try and prevent reoccurrences of the same type of instances. And it is, and it is an, an ongoing challenge. There is no question about it. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Crowley. I mean, we, we're going to have a few more questions. You know, Corizon has been subject to multiple investigations by the New York State Commission uh, on Correction, including recent inquiries into the deaths uh, of inmates and inmate injuries. The SCOC report cited lapses by the city and Corizon that violated state law and that, quote, directly implicated in the death of Bradley Ballard. The report concluded that, quote, had Ballard received adequate and appropriate medical and mental health care and supervision and intervention when he became critically ill, his death would have been prevented. The medical and mental health care was so incompetent and inadequate as to, quote, unquote, shock the conscience. Among the report's recommendations for the Department of Health was whether to consider whether Corizon, quote, is fit to continue in light of delivery of flagrantly inadequate, substandard and dangerous medical and mental health care to this individual. You know you can't talk about it because there's litigation that's ongoing. That's damning. That's a damning excerpt from this report. I just think it's important to say. I mean, we're talking about people's lives here. Okay, you made some, uh, I, I wanna understand, you stated in your testimony that the relationships between DOC, DOHMH, Corizon, CMA, and CDA, it's complicated, we know that. You stated that it could be improved somehow. How could it be improved? How could this interplay amongst all these different players be improved? So can, can I first say that with regard to um, the, the case that you mentioned that we stand ready to, to work with Department of Mental Health, I mean Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, Department of Corrections, and all others to ensure that nothing like that ever happens again. So, um, in terms of um, in terms of what can be better, the specific things. Uh, for example, um, as president of CMA, I'm on the island every day, Monday through Friday, uh, supervising and caring for patients. One of our concerns, one of our concerns is better communication with Department of Corrections so that health and Department of Corrections understand a similar mission when it comes to caring for inmates. We now have established a clinic captain's meeting where medical staff, nursing staff, and correctional, correctional captains in the clinic that are in charge of 
production of patients at the clinic meet on a monthly basis to discuss productivity. Does the contract that you all receive through Corizon CMA and CDA, does it provide for enough staff to properly administer health services? We certainly welcome additional funding. Does it provide currently, right now, does it provide enough money to adequately deliver health care services to the current inmate population on Rikers Island? Given... It's a yes or no. The, the money that you receive right now, can you deliver the care? Given the significant uh, issues regarding mental health, I would have to say no. No, okay. So that's good to hear because I think that's in line with what DOHMH said. They got new monies, they cre expanded pace, they created caps, they're trying to do these things to help the seriously men ser serious mentally ill uh, people on Rikers Island. Um, DOHMH has implemented an innovative uh, EHR, electronic health record system, for the, correctional, for the correctional system. Is Corizon staff fully trained in using this system? Is your, does your staff know, know how to use it? Yes. Uh, how can it be leveraged to improve health outcomes? We use it every day. The, the issues uh, regarding eClinical Works, which is the electronic health record we have, it took a while to get it up and running. Um, it's a electronic medical record that was utilized in the community, and now we've attempted to taper it for correctional health care. We've, uh, working with IT from the Department of Health, have been able to design templates that track chronic care illnesses such as diabetes, hypertension, seizure disorder, chronic hepatitis C, asthma. So when, as I referenced, the 35% of patients that are come in on intake with a chronic medical problem, we, we're able to closely monitor them and track them throughout their stay. And an EHR can have triggers built into it that will do things like um, flag when a certain parameter of care may not have been completed or prevent you from going on to the next step of care if, if um, a particular pathway was not done to ensure that a particular condition may have been ruled out. So it, is in, it can be used in that way as an adjunct to the clinical care to help make sure that um, certain clinical signs, symptoms uh, are not missed and, that, um, and avoid poor outcomes that way. And it, it, it also allows us to work more toward outcome measures of quality of care which I believe is one of the reasons why this meeting was called today, to look at the quality of care at Rikers Island. How do you measure quality of care in a correctional facility? And I believe that the electronic health record allows us to do a better job and track process improvements as well as outcome improvements. I think you're right. I mean, I'm very glad that this was implemented in 2008, and I hope that it's working to help your clinicians and doctors to actually improve uh, care and, and quality of care there. Uh, in two, last year, uh, Corizon was issued the highest level of censure by the Federal Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, for failing to protect its employees from violence at Rikers Island and was fined $71,000. You talked about, both of you in your testimony, that the safety and well-being of your employees is of utmost importance to you all in a very dangerous environment. You talked about how, or we heard from, that panic buttons are now being installed in places where correction officers don't have a direct uh, line of vision, uh, and for privacy reasons, for the inmates that are being ta uh, uh, handled at the time. What, what, why, why were you fined $71,000 for not protecting your employees? I'm not able to speak to the OSHA complaint directly, but I can tell you what we're doing now. Specifically, we've looked at safety in each of our 11 medical clinics on the island. We've, we work with employees, corrections, captains, and wardens in the facility, at the facility level, and meet with them on a monthly basis. We've gone through walkthroughs of work areas, the clinic areas where our staff work day in and day out with Department of Health, with Department of Corrections, with the warden, and we've identified issues such as lines of sight. We've identified issues 
such as uh, where requesting officers to roam through the clinic to keep an eye on staff. So we work with the Department of Corrections, who's in charge of providing the security in the correctional facilities. So, so I, I'm, I'm grateful that you all came today. Uh, I am very grateful for the work that your uh, clinicians, doctors, nurses, providers do on a daily basis. As you said, Dr. Cowan, 365 days a year, 24 hours a day on Rikers Island. I'm grateful that the system has things in place like a 24-hour intake so that we're getting information right away. Uh, you know, I, I still feel like there are serious questions which haven't been answered. Uh, and this is not in any way criticizing individuals who are on Rikers Island providing these services. But again, the leadership question is a big one. When I talked to your chief uh, executive officer before, I went through some of these things, he had no idea. It was embarrassing. I was going through basic information with him. He didn't know what the hell I was talking about. I'm saying you're the CEO of Horizon and you don't even know some of the basic things in this report. So, you know, I'm glad you're there and hopefully getting information and and but we need some leadership. We need you all to say, okay, we now have 200 beds under caps and pace. We need to get up to 800 given the seriously mentally ill population on Rikers Island. Let's work together with corrections and DOHMH and the city council to identify how much money that is. You all are the ones providing the care. Be proactive. Come up with proposals to help the city fulfill its mission in getting people the standard services that they deserve and need. So I hope that there are revisions to the contract to bake some of this in a little further if the contract gets renewed. And I hope that you all take this, you know, you're saying you take it seriously, but you know, it's, hearing about these families who have lost people on Rikers Island is heartbreaking because, you know, they're not getting insulin medicine or they're being locked in their cells and not getting, it's awful. That's why I am so outraged. And until we get a change in leadership from the top down, figuring out how to fix these things, we're going to keep hearing these awful things. And thank God the press has been all over this. The New York Times has done an outstanding job, as has the AP and others, in really driving this home. And it's not going to stop. So I'm grateful you came here today. I hope with that you come to us proactively. We're in budget season. We can work to get more money to fix things on Rikers Island. But I... You know, don't feel confident given that you've been there for so long and that these problems have persisted and have been so endemic and rooted there. Start to change course. Come to us proactively with systems reforms and what you need to fix things at Rikers Island. Thank you for coming today. We're going to go to our next panel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Lily Carino and Dr. Matthew Hurley from Doctors Council. So we, so we have to be out of this room in the next 15 minutes, but we're not ending the hearing because I want to hear from everyone, and this is very important, as you can tell. So what we're going to do is we're going to hear from this panel and their testimony, and then we're going to move next door to the cafeteria, and we're going to set that up as a hearing room because there's another hearing after this. 
So we have to be out to be respectful to the Civil Rights Committee, which is meeting, and then we're going to move next door so that everyone has the opportunity to testify. You may begin in whatever order you'd like. Please identify yourself for the record and speak directly into the mic. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Lily Carino Higgins. I'm the director of the Political Fund at 1199. Um, in the interest of time, I am not going to read my testimony. It is four pages long. But I want to point out the three issues that we at 1199 find um, need to be addressed in order to improve the conditions for the workers. The first is the issue of the 40% of inmates suffering from mental illness um, and there not being sufficient beds to treat them. Many of them are in prison for low level crimes and or violations and just can't post bail. If that number is accurate, corrections officers must receive training on how to deal with that population. That is currently not occurring um, at levels that we are comfortable with. Uh, with regard to, sa to worker safety, we know that not all inmates are mentally ill or violent. But these are prisons and the city is responsible for ensuring the safety of these workers, the visitors, and the inmates. We can sit here and blame Corizon. But coordinating with DOC has been a big issue for us and if this is not addressed, every su successor provider, be it HHC or Damien, will have the exact same issues and the exact same results. Corizon doesn't run the facilities and they cannot assign or direct the officers to protect anyone. Um, and then the third is that the staffing levels of corrections officers are just inadequate. Uh, there have been cuts and given the change in the population, it is absolutely essential that they increase those level, the levels of staffing because one shutdown in the facility, uh, you basically have to uh, redirect all of the medical appointments and patients are just not getting medication which just uh, leads to other incidents. Um, so generally we support the concept of uh, intro 440. We would like to have all of these reports online um, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Dr. Hurley. Good afternoon, Chairman. If you could turn your mic on, make sure the red light's on. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Crowley, Chairman Johnson, and members of the Health uh, and Criminal Justice and Fire Committees. My name is Dr. Matthews Hurley. I'm Vice President of Doctors Council at SEIU, which represents thousands of doctors in the metropolitan <coughs> area, including every HAC facility. Uh, the DOH and New York City jails, including Rikers and Vernon C. Baines Barge. Doctors Council SEIU is here today in support of Intro 440 and to provide input in the state of access to quality care at Rikers and VCBC from the perspective of the frontline medical workers. Over the course of the last two years, Doctors Council has worked with the New York City Board of Corrections in helping to convene various parties, including the DC, uh, DOC, uh, Corizon, DOH, MH, Neisner, 1199, COBA, and other stakeholders to ensure that stronger workplace safety standards at Rikers Island continue to be a priority. The environment in which doctors and nurses and other healthcare st uh, staff operate has clear impl implications for patient care. Last year, the U.S. Department of Labor, OSHA, uh, cited Corizon for two violations of federal workplace safety laws. The allegations include a charge that the company willfully failed to protect its employees from violence. We call on Corizon and DOC to work together to follow the important recommendations that OSHA made to correct the safety violations. While many of our members are incredibly dedicated doctors who have worked at Rikers for 10 years recruiting and retaining doctors and psychiatrists in this difficult and sometimes dangerous work environment is very challenging and VCBC, uh, an outside vendor, has recently taken over medical services and continues to face significant recruitment challenges. Healthcare workers need to work, uh, need to know that the work environment is secure and there exists a culture of engagement and collaboration among agencies working at Rikers. Employee 
Training on safety and security procedures is critical for Corizon staff, as well as training on how to prevent or minimize risk of assault. Doctors Council supports the recommendations of OSHA findings, which recommends protocols for treating inmates that pose a high risk for violence, implementing physical plant changes such as reconfiguring treatment areas for better egress and sight lines with correction officers, uh, installing panic alarm buttons, cuff bars, and plexiglass in treatment rooms, collecting statistics on medical worker assaults is important to the understanding the climate that the doctors work in. Currently, staffing is below where it should be at Rikers and, and VCBC. For example, there are 11 full-time vacancies and one psychiatry vacancy at Rikers out of 60 full-time doctors. That is about 20 percent full-time vacancy rate. Furthermore, mandated overtime totaled about 3,000 hours in 2014. One psychiatrist was mandated 300 hours over time in 2014, which equals to about 37 tours. This is not including voluntary overtime. While the overall number of inmates at Rikers has declined, the complexity, acuity, and percentage of mentally uh, ill inmates has increased. More doctors are badly needed on the island to address these demographic changes. While Corizon is the employer of health care staff at Rikers and they have a responsibility to act, the reality is that all of the involved parties must work together to enact change. For example, getting inmates to the clinic for treatment in a timely fashion is the domain of the DOC. The number of canceled follow-up appointments, wait times, and overcrowding waiting areas at Rikers are all indicators that access to care is falling short. Emergencies and lockdowns that shut down clinic operations on a regular basis, as well as lack of escorts, further limit access to care. During the second half of 2014, more than 15,000 follow-up appointments made at the MAMKC, only 8,000 uh, 8, of those were canceled. That is, more than 50 percent of follow-ups were canceled. We feel that this is imperative that better scheduling and escort systems be established to reduce waiting time for sick inmates and to ensure their timely follow-up care. Inmates at Rikers and VCBC are not in jail for a long time. They may be there only for several weeks. Patient care, need, uh, uh, care means ensuring that the bureaucracy is streamlined so that the health care records are available to the medical staff immediately at intake. Furthermore, upon release, we would recommend coordinating follow-up care in the community at the HAC facilities or hospital of choice and focus on including health insurance access, uh, clinic appointments, and necessary prescriptions. In conclusion, Doctors Council supports the collection and reporting of data on health inmates in the city correctional facilities and recommend looking at appointments wait times, canceled follow-ups, examining transfer protocols and times, and streamlining health care, uh, health record access, along with increasing workplace safety standards to make Rikers a viable place of employment and accessible in terms of health care to its patients. Thank you for the opportunity for, to testify. Okay, finish with this. <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Hurley, and thank you, um, Ms. Carino, for for uh, for being here today. Uh, uh, you know, anyone who takes a job on Rikers Island delivering healthcare services has to be commended. I mean, it's a, such a difficult place to work and provide services in. Uh, Dr. Hurley, uh, thank you for. In educating me today, uh, 
I did not realize that, you know, close to 20% of the needed staff uh, at VCBC uh, is vacant, uh, especially one psychiatry vacancy. Um, and we're talking about how large the seriously mentally ill population is there. And the number of overtime, overtime hours, 3,000 hours in 2014, uh, one psychiatrist mandated 300 hours, which equals 37 tours. It's unbelievable. I mean, we have to, we have to hire more clinicians and physicians and nurses uh, and clinical staff to actually be there to treat on the island. Uh, how much more staff do you think we need? I can't, I can't tell you exactly the number. I would have to get back but to But we at that. least have to fill the vacancies yes. right away. Yes. And why, why are they not being filled? Because it's hard to attract people? It's hard to attract. Uh, and with the safety record, and, and, and those have become great concern, uh, there, is a, there are disparities between uh, uh, salary structure for uh, those who work on the island and those who work in the HAC facilities. So a lot of uh, psychiatrists and all that will tend to go other places. Um, but it can, those things can be worked out. It has, uh, oh, go just, ahead. May I just add that? Uh, the number of additional staff needed is not something that we're prepared to answer, but if we look at the overtime records, it would indicate what staff deficiencies um, exist. That's helpful. Uh, has uh, 1199 or uh, the Doctors Council recently, given all of the attention that's being paid uh, to Rikers, have you guys been the leadership at your unions been asked to sit down with the Department of Corrections, the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, and Corizon to talk about what improvements you think could be made to the system? There is a safety committee that meets regularly, and uh, Dr. Um, Homer Venter is a part of that, as is Corizon and all of the unions uh, that provide health care. The other thing I want to point out is that there are at closer to 20 unions on the island, not just the three healthcare providing unions. You know, you've got UFT and DC 37. There are a lot of unions there that also need to be brought to the table. Do you recommend a similar committee for the provision of medical care? There is a committee for, for medical care. Oh. Uh, I, I would just say yes, we've been involved from the beginning about patient safety. Uh, safety. I know Lori Davison, our contract administrator on Rikers, have been very vocal and working hard and, and doctors' council as a whole on this issue. Um, uh, and uh, from, from the beginning, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Well, thank you both for being so patient and being here all afternoon to, to testify. I really appreciate uh, the, that you're here on behalf of your members and they should know that uh, we really do appreciate their service and the important compassionate work that they provide on Rikers Island and in our facility. So thank you very much. Thank so, you. Oh, do you have a question? Oh, I'm sorry. Councilmember Crowley has, uh, Chair Crowley has questions. I apologize. Just a few. Thank you. Um, First, Ms. Carino, uh, well, thank you for your testimony. You mentioned about the regular uh, committees that meet that are already in existence. And I bet at every one of these meetings there are uh, recommendations that must be Correct. put forth to the Department of Health, the Department of Corrections. Have you felt that they've been meeting your recommendations? Have they been doing more to help? Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. um, it, the situation, as, as uh, someone testified earlier, is very complex. Um, something as simple as getting um, cuff bars, for example, came out of our committee. Um, but the implementation... Can you explain what that is? Um, I think um, the doctor would be able to better describe. I've never seen them or used them. Cuff or bars? <laughs> Yes. Cuff bars? It's basically where you cuff yeah. inmates so that they're not free to move around. But um, implementing cuff bars or ins installation of cuff bars is uh, in the purview of the Department of Corrections. So we can sit at a table 
um, and make all kinds of recommendations. The panic buttons, for example, is one that's been, uh, we've been talking about for over two years. And they finally did install them. But first, there's a question about uh, the effectiveness of what they've done. Um, but it, it really falls under the Department of Corrections. And then the last thing is, a lot of decisions are made. Like We can make recommendations about the panic buttons, for example. Um, and the Department of Corrections will install them uh, when they see fit. But in executing, they don't always consult the staff. So the placement, for example, of the panic buttons was one that raised concerns. Because you have a doctor against the wall and then a patient, and the panic button is by the door. So you can't Why get to it in case of an incident. That's the problem to me is that you're, they're relying on technology Correct. or a button across the room. Electrical Why wiring. Why is there not a correction officer escorting the inmate to the doctor's room? It's, uh, there's, there are privacy issues. There are a, a lot of other issues, but there are ways there's to mitigate that. privacy issues that get in the way? That is a big part of it, I think. And the other is the, the staffing levels. I mean, I don't think that there are enough correction officers to escort every patient and to remain with every um, inmate while they're being treated. Um, well, that's not a good enough answer. That more has to be done. It certainly um, could be some way of putting uh, some device on the officers head so they don't hear or listen we agree to, we agree uh, make sure the HIPAA mm -hmm. laws are not violated um, because your members should not be in danger Correct. when they're trying to give care um, I'm shocked by the percentage of fall off on follow-up visits um, and I could imagine how frustrated uh, people who are mentally ill uh, must be when having to wait a long time which could aggravate a system could, could aggravate uh, when somebody uh, aggravate the system. Uh, just to give an example of that, of, of that, of uh, that, after intake, if a patient has to see a psychiatrist for prescriptions, they may wait up to five days to being able to see a, a psychiatrist, which is just simply too long when you have uh, certain types of medical illnesses, uh, psychi psychiatric illnesses. How bad has the staffing been? Uh, in terms of the, there not being enough doctors and clinicians, I understand that you're not, there's approximately 20% of vacancies, but even if those vacancies were filled, um, what is the excuse that there are so many inmates that are not being seen or not getting the diagnosis when Corey Johnson read off the list of the various different inmates who died, I mean, what, what is the one of the One of the things that happens at Rikers is that if, uh, if an incident happens at another site, uh, alarm goes off and everything shuts down, and that happens frequently throughout the course of the day. And what tends to happen is that a eight-hour session, uh, a clinical session, is reduced down to about five hours or so, four or five hours, so cut in half. So even though you have the short staffing that you have, uh, is on top of that, you have these alarms that are, that are not, um, you know, just to that particular site, are just broad-based and shut down the whole operation, even in the medical clinic, which is uh, problematic. Problematic, of course. And just final question, uh, in comparison to the HHC system, I know that you have members of uh, your various different unions that work as whether it be doctors or healthcare professionals. Are they getting paid more? Why are there so many vacancies at, in Rikers? Are they paying less, Horizon, in comparison to HHC? If you look at, uh, and you would have to look at different HHC facilities, it's, it's kind of different across uh, the board, but um, if you compare uh, some of the hospitals, it's about a 20% differential or lower salary. In addition to uh, the, the, hist uh, the historic knowledge of uh, the problems that exist at Rikers, it, it makes it a challenge to staff it. 
I have a tremendous amount of uh, respect and I'm very grateful for the work that your members do. And, and just when you're telling me now that in addition to them having to fear for their safety, being uh, in the process of doing their profession given care, uh, that they're paid actually less than other public facilities in our city, substantially less. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Crowley. We are going to uh, take a 10 minute adjournment just so everyone can uh, move over to the to the room, go to the bathroom, and we're going to start back up. Uh, and then, just so folks know, uh, the next panel is Jennifer Parrish, John Boston, Deandra Khan, Riley Doyle Evans, and Barry Campbell. And then, following that, Deirdre Shore, Alex Abel, uh, Evie Litwalk, Victoria Phillips, and Terry Hubbard. And th that's it. So, five minute adjournment.